match of the season for the All Blacks. An intercept, Dalton Papali. Getting close to the line, Cody Taylor scores. No doubt a few words exchanged. And it's worked brilliantly again. Here's the pace, Rico Yawani, what a try. Barrett showed no clear release on Marcus Smith. Well, they will award the try, Jeff. Oh, the whole thing's a shambles. That's what I'll say. Charging hard, fullback Stewart. George! No, they haven't made it. Yes, they have. I'm not sure. That looks like a try. What an exciting finish. To an epic test. 25 all draw. Tēnā koutou kato. good evening and welcome into the breakdown. What a crazy weekend of rugby we have just witnessed. Portugal beat the USA to qualify for the Rugby World Cup. Georgia stunned Wales 10 months before they will play each other in France next year. And after 70 minutes of rugby at Twickenham, no one would have thought the All Blacks and England would play out a draw. But that is rugby at the end of the day. We're going to discuss it all, plus hand out our end of season awards on the breakdown tonight. So Fa'ono, Ken Laban, Taylor Johnson, Isaac Bob all join us on the panel. Thank you so much. Ken, what did you make of the weekend as a whole? Well, I think it's a reflection of where the professional game is now. Um, and, you, and you alluded to some of those close, uh, those close results and some of the, what we would normally regard as upsets, which are now becoming norm and par for the course. Like, if we want to talk about norm and par for the course, well, then England beat the Black Ferns in the final at Eden Park last week. Well, it didn't happen. Um, our expectation, given our fantastic record against England, was that this would be another comfortable win, except somebody forgot to tell England that. <laughs> they, they got up at, at the end. Sure, they had the numerical advantage with uh, Bowden sitting down for 10 minutes, but nonetheless, it made for a thrilling contest. Disappointment from an All Black mm. point of view that they didn't get the win, but nonetheless, a thrilling match. Yeah, I think the test matches uh, throughout the whole interview tour have been fantastic because, as you said, there's, there's no preconceived ideas as to who's going to win, you know. You saw Italy beat Australia. They've only ever won 11 games in the Six Nations since being there since the year 2000. So to get a big scalp like the Wallabies last weekend was incredible. And just the game this morning was wow. As well. So, look, I've never got up so many times at 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. to actually watch these games because I'd always think, oh, you know, they will get the win too. easily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I've, I've been up uh, a few weekends in a row all night watching all the games because they're all so exciting. And I think the thing is, us as being in the Southern Hemisphere, and we spoke about earlier on, yeah, we actually got to give these Northern Hemisphere teams a little bit more respect because anyone can beat anyone on their day. And uh, it's, we always talk about the fans wanting a better product, and that's what it's all about at the moment, I think. And I think, um, you know, like you said, Italy, everything, the World Cup next year is wide open and it's, it's really good to see. Well, if we zone in on the result at Twickenham this morning, how do you explain... 19 points, being up by 19 points with nine minutes to go, Ken. How do you explain a draw from that, from an All Blacks perspective? Well, you have to put it in the context of 30 penalties mm. um, in the game. And don't forget, penalty, set the mark, take the kick, set the line out, make the play. And then this was an enormous um, bit in the game when Bowden got Sinbin. Exactly the same way as what happened to the England player last week in the Black Ferns. Um, final and of course that, those tries at the end came on the edge where under normal circumstances that's where Bowden would have been defending mm. and we saw that situation where Rickle was left with two players and he had to as we all do when we get faced with that situation you just got to close your eyes and guess mm. and he went for the outside guy and the fullback got in on the inside of him well under normal circumstances that play would have been covered mm. that try's not scored and we win but we can speculate till the cows come home I thought it was fantastic um, I thought it was a fantastic occasion, um, full house, lots of drama, compelling viewing and the fact that the Northern Hemisphere team won at home is going to be great as everybody builds momentum towards the World Cup in France next year. Was it good viewing from a fan's perspective when you talk about those 30 penalties that were blown across 80 minutes, Taylor? Yeah, well, it was difficult to watch because a lot of the time you just wanted to see things flow and it actually changed the way that the players played. You look at that kick that TJ Pedernada did with two minutes to go, usually you just would have held on to that, but because the ruck was being so heavily scrutinised, he would have put that kick in. The execution, probably a bit off, wanted to go a little bit deeper, but that would have been why he did it. And then interesting Interestingly, you know, we're here at the end of the game. England said, well, they thought they would have conceded a penalty at the ruck and they kicked it out. And it was so on the nose because on their social media they said, never give up, and then posted the draw. And I thought, well, you did give up because you didn't go for the win. You know, you, you were down by so much and to forge such an amazing comeback and then settle for the draw. I was like, come on. Like, you know, I would have loved to see the All Blacks win, but how good would that comeback have been if they actually chanced their arm? That's a good point because Ian Foster was asked about it and there's no way that his men would have kicked the ball out of the 
last shoe was in the opposite foot. Yeah, and I guess uh, Fozzie's probably having a real smile because I think that's purely down to the coaching. Eddie Jones is under the pump mm. and he's fought back to get them a draw. You can even see uh, Marcus Smith looking around, what do I do? Whereas there's, there's nothing really to play for in this game at the moment except for getting into these moments that are going to win you a World Cup. And they had the prime opportunity and the last play of the game to go and win them a World Cup or, or have a practice for it and they chose to kick it out and take a draw with a, with a match that really meant nothing but bragging rights. I remember years ago when Graham Murray was the captain I think they were playing in Wales and uh, they were down 10-7 and um, they got awarded a penalty in front of the posts. I kicked the penalty and they take out the 10 all draw. He opted to go for the line-out. And when he was interviewed after the game, he said, even if we'd kicked the penalty, we still wouldn't have won. Mm. Just the difference in the mindset and mm -hmm. the, you know, in the, uh, in the, I can't recall what game it was, but I remember the incident clearly. You've got to give it to England for their stickability, for having the belief and staying in it for that 70 minutes when they clearly didn't look like they were in the game, Taylor. There are a few unsung heroes as well. The replacement prop, Will Stewart, coming in, scoring two tries, and Marcus Smith getting them yeah. in a position to be in that draw. 100%. Like, the bench was outstanding for them, and they really made that difference. And you do got to give it up to them because uh, they missed so many more tackles than the All Blacks did. Uh, they made less amount of tackles as well. But they actually did um, win the possession and territory game as well, which was quite interesting given that scoreline. Um, but I think, you know, although it's still a draw, England will look at that as, you know, technically a win for them to be able to come back like that because, you know, to forge a 19-point comeback against the All Blacks with, you know, nine minutes to go. Not many teams can say they've done that. Um, but as you said, that bench was outstanding. But particularly the replacement halfback as well. I think that that just changed the game immensely as well. Well, he's one of the most experienced players for England, isn't he? Will Young. Um, but if you look at some of the good things for the All Blacks, we saw some clever kicking, which led to a brilliant Rico Ioane try. They did some really good things for 60, 70 minutes, didn't they? Yeah, and I agree. And actually, I think it's been a real... Um, uh, a point of their game in the Northern Hemisphere at the end of the season that's really stood out is their kicking game. It's come a long way. If we look at earlier in the year where Ireland were getting all over the top of us is because we weren't putting in those, our kicking game wasn't on, on point. And I think that's really good development in the game so far. I think it's, uh, it's going to be exciting for next year for, for the All Blacks as well. What about the All Blacks goal line defence, Ken? England couldn't score. They had opportunities, didn't they? But the All Blacks would just, would just shut them down. Yeah, exactly. Well, they were under a lot of pressure, obviously, with only 14 in the defence line and uh, England doing normally what we're used to seeing the All Blacks do at the back end of games. Attacking the edge, keeping the ball alive and taking the opportunities when they're there. And a couple of controversial, well you could call it controversial, but in the end you watch it long enough and the ball was on the line. And uh, in this case, uh, here where the, try, where the try was awarded. What I did like as well on defence is that they were on their goal line, but they still weren't afraid to hunt and try and get that ball. You know, Adi Savia, Dota Papali, they weren't afraid of actually trying to attack that. And they were actually defending positively as opposed to just making tackles, rolling away. Um, and the de defence was so staunch, I really enjoyed it. But equally, I really enjoyed um, that enterprise on attack, like those crossfield kicks. That was, that was something different that they haven't done a lot of this year. And I think, you know, the team that um, played earlier in the year towards and then the end of their tour, there's just been a little bit of a change and um, attitude. Still not as um, entertaining as the Black Ferns in the back line, but it's, it's a step, it's getting closer. Well, talking about the back line, there are a couple of uh, experiments, if you will, in there. Geordie Barrett at 12, Mark Talia retained on the wing. Did you like those two options? Yeah, I did. And I think um, Geordie Barrett was noticed that it was, he was the one that was, um, oh, sorry, that made the difference when they went off, you know what I mean? But Barrett's been brilliant, Talia's been brilliant when he's had a chance, uh, and it's giving that little bit of you know, competitive edge around those certain positions. Yeah, exactly. No, I think it's been terrific. Like when I first came across, Geordie was at the Jock Hobbs under 19s when he was playing for Canterbury a few years ago when he was just a kid at 17, 18 years old. He was a second five uh, then and he's always wanted to play second five. And at the Hurricanes, he's had to play, uh, you know, when he first came in as a youngster, he's had to play behind some pretty big names in that 12 jersey for the Hurricanes. So he's had to be patient to get his, uh, to get his opportunity. But at six foot five and 105, um, kilos. He's a huge human being yeah. to, um, for all defences to deal with. And I agree with you, and I think he's actually shown his maturity because he's carried that Hurricanes backline somewhat for the last couple of years, and you feel gee, if he was in another team, he'd be out shining in other players, but now it's coming through in, in, in what he's showing on the field for the ABs. And it also kind of links
links back to that Rugby World Cup discussion for next year because you can only take 33 men and when you've got someone who can literally play every position in that back line and look we haven't seen him at 10 but I'm pretty sure he could go in there um, he looks like a really appetising selection too. It is going to be so hard to pick that 33 man squad but one fella that will definitely be there is Brody Italic. He joined an exclusive club in 2012 becoming an All Black for the first time and overnight at Twickenham he played his 100th test. Here's his story. Yeah, I'm pretty, uh, pretty stoked to say I'm the 12th. Um, and when I first started out, it probably wasn't something that I had as a goal or thought I'd possibly do, but um, you know, with being around, I've seen uh, maybe eight or nine of those 11 that have currently done it, achieved the 100 games. And yeah, I don't know, when, probably when I got to 50, I thought, geez, it'd be pretty cool if I can make it to 100 and, and, and on. So yeah, here I am, and I'm pretty, pretty proud to be able to say once I achieve it that I have. Do you feel as though you're a different player now than you were? I think so. I think the game's changed. You know, defensively, um, the way teams are defending is, is different. You know, there was a lot of running rugby in my early days. I think, um, although I was super rugby, I th remember one game I cleaned out 50 rucks. It was just a different style of game to now, but um, hopefully uh, I'm a little bit street smarter and <laughs> with a bit of age and experience. So you're taking shortcuts then? Yeah, you're saying, <laughs> no, not it? shortcuts, nice. just work smarter, not harder. Ah, nice, <laughs> nice. Everyone's got someone that you look forward to playing. Have you got an opponent that you can't wait for the challenge every time you know that that person's going to be there? Probably even Ed Smith is, is one, you know. I'll, you know whenever you're going to turn up, turn up and play South Africa, they're going to be physical, and especially him in particular. Um, we're a similar age, we've played a lot of rugby against each other, so... You know, and even at this age, at the moment at this age, he's still going unbelievably well. So I always know when, when facing him, it's going to be a tough challenge. How do you get on off the field then, you and Eben? Probably haven't had a lot to do with each other, to be fair. In the, in the early days of being in here, the All Blacks and the Springboks didn't socialise at all post-match. The last few years, we have a little bit more and shared a few beers and had a few conversations, but uh, yeah, it was probably as far as it's gone. Right from when I first made the Chiefs, there was a clear clear point made that you know what happens on the field happens on the field and when you walk off we leave it there and you know when come up against Liam Messam and Tanner Latimer, all those fellas and then when come into the All Blacks you had to fight for your position so yeah you know what happens on the field is it stays on the field for me and, and when you come off it's, it's all about being friends and enjoying it. Follow up question then what do you enjoy about the game the most? Probably the competition of the game is definitely but the most enjoyable part is probably you know post a good win Test match sitting in the sheds with with the boys, you know, we've been working hard for it all week and, and just enjoying that and with your mates on tour, it's hard to beat. Yes, a very special moment for one of the giants of the game in New Zealand, Brody Retallick becoming the 12th All Black Centurion. Uh, and he proves a point that it's okay to be a slow starter, isn't it, Ken? Because he wasn't a standout at high school, he didn't get picked up for Canterbury, but someone else saw talent in him. Tom Coventry was the coach who picked him up. He's uh, Brady Retallick, the greatest player from Christchurch never to play for Canterbury or the Crusaders. And when he was a schoolboy at Christchurch Boys High with Tom Coventry, was running the New Zealand team. And um, he had just been appointed to Hawke's Bay. And he asked Brady what Brady was doing his first year out of school. He said he wasn't doing anything, had no deal. So he took him to Hawke's Bay with him. At the end of Tom's first year with Hawke's Bay, he got appointed to assist Dave Rennie at the Chiefs. And he took Brady with him there as well, and the rest is history. Terrific story. I remember talking to the late, great Sir Colin Meads a few years ago, and we were talking about locks, and I introduced Colin on air as the greatest um, of all time. And I remember he waited around after the interview, and he wasn't. He politely, to he politely told me off. He said, oh, Ken, what you said about me being the greatest, he said, thank you for saying that. He said, but I'm not. He goes, that boy from the Chiefs. Wow. Brady Retallick, you keep an eye on him. Wow. He's, the, he's the greatest all black lock I've ever seen, him and Sam Whitelock. Wow. So, you know, right from a young age, he's been a, a quality player. You could see from that interview that uh, Jeff Wilson did with him, he's a, he's a class act. That's a phenomenal story, isn't it? And Taylor, this is your position. You love this sort <laughs> of thing. Second rowers do so much hard work. <laughs> no, like, the thing is, is though, you know, he mentioned it, the game's changed so much since when he made his debut. You know, he said he would clear 50 rucks in a game and now it's changed. And the thing about that and what makes him such a great athlete is that he's adapted with the game as well. He's got such a wide-ranging skill set. He's so uncompromising on attack and on defence. You can always count on him to put his head down and just give it a go. And he brings that niggle as well. Like, a lot of teams have it, um, but he can really get inside an opposition's head. We saw him and Evan Etzebeth, who was another fantastic lock, but I really love the contribution he gives to not only the All Blacks jersey, but every team he plays for.
Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. He's got that hard nose, uncompromising attitude, but he can separate the on-field and off-field. Yep. And what I like about him is, and it probably comes through in that interview, and I never tell you, he's so so humble, but he's a culture leader within the team, mm. and he doesn't ask uh, much of everyone else that he wouldn't do himself. But he also drives those standards, and uh, he expects that humility from everything. It's really nice to see his family, you know, there as well, and his yeah. partner um, celebrating that uh, moment with him uh, yeah. in Twickenham. He is going to go down as one of the greats of the game, isn't he, Ken? It no is a phenomenal story that you just told. Uh, he tends to get in people's heads, and so does the head coach of England, Eddie Jones. Uh, Eddie, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear your thoughts on that game because the game was, was gone, essentially, but your team showed great courage. What did you make of the contest as a whole? Well, I thought, yeah, New Zealand played superbly the first half. I haven't seen them play with that consistency in terms of being aggressive around the ball. They use their tactical attacking kicks to, to real advantage. And I thought they were superb. And we just had to hang in there. Sometimes you just got to hang in there, you know, take what you can. Everything seems to be going against you. And then those games, you're always going to get a period where it goes your way. You know, you start to get the 50-50 from the ref. You start one one or two players fall off. And we just had to... We had to to stay in the fight and then when we got our opportunity I thought we were superb. So they're clearly disappointed because they felt as though they went let one slip. Are you really happy with the way you've finished or do you expect more of this group? Oh no, we expect more. You know, we're not happy with the first 40 but sometimes when, you got, when you're not at your best, like we were probably 2 or 3% off in the first half, that to find your best is one of the, the most important things. And I reckon in any team's development, there are certain moments you have that are really important. Maybe one of those was today for us. Would you have liked to have maybe gone for the win at the end? I mean, and was your instinct maybe you had the advantage, still had a one-man advantage, maybe played a few phases? Or when Marcus Smith decides to kick for touch, you go, you know what, enough's enough? So I remember a long time ago, I used to coach Super Rugby with the Brumbies and we'd play against the Highlanders. And if that was the case, we'd run from anywhere. But, you know, the referee today wasn't too kind on the attacking ruck team. So I think there was a lot of sense in what they did. All right, you finish the season now with South Africa coming up next week. This is probably good preparation, right? You know how much or how well you have to play next week? Yeah, no, it's fantastic, mate. You know, they've probably set this game as the game they want to win. Um, so we're going to find the best of them, as we found probably found the best of the All Blacks today. So, you know, it's great preparation for next season. It's always nice to see you smiling regardless. Thanks so much for joining us. Cheers, mate. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Ken, uh, before the show, you actually mentioned when he was coaching back at the Brumbies, and he's a happy coach, isn't he? What did you make of those comments? Yeah, exactly. He's an engaging and charismatic personality. Um, Eddie Jones is one of the great coaches on the international scene, playing the All Blacks, uh, you know, without with the All Black legacy, with the England legacy at Twickenham, the way that they promoted the game, Ian Foster, Eddie Jones, like, you know, the, all, all, basically all the big dogs rocking and rolling at Twickenham. Uh, it does make it, it does, it, it does add to the quality um, of the event that is such a, such a grand occasion. It was such a great contest. We need characters in the game, don't, like, don't oh, we? Yeah, we? That's do. what makes the game so special. And what about this season that we've had? The year 2022, we're going to do our season review now. The All Blacks finished with eight wins, one draw, four losses. Of course, the first ever series loss to Ireland in New Zealand, the first ever loss to Argentina as well. But they won all the trophies. They won the Rugby Championship. They won the Bledisloe Cup. They won the Freedom Cup, so they've won all the trophies that they possibly could. But if you're going to put a rating on the season, Bossy, how do you rate this team? Yeah, I'd say they're probably ro rocking it around 7 out of 10 at the moment, you know. So I think everything's put in perspective of us. We always try to probably judge them a little bit harder, harsher compared to what we judge everyone else. And when you look at how Ireland are going, still number one in the world, Argentina beating England, our losses have not been to bad teams. But... We're not where we need to be in terms of being able to close out those matches like like the one um, against uh, England last night. And those are ones that probably just holding us back to maybe a, a, a good season, I think, with the trophies and the occasions we've had. But uh, to go that next level, we've got, we've got to... We've got to increase it by 20, 30%. 70% for you, Taylor. What about you? Yeah, I'm in agreement. Look, I think we have to look at the international game and see how far other teams have come. Yes, we do hold the All Blacks to such a high standard because of that big legacy that they have had. And particularly in a year before Rugby World Cup, this is where you usually see the team fire and head in to the next year looking really good. But we haven't settled on combinations. We don't know who our best pairings are in a lot of places. Um, but as you said, look, we didn't lose the Bledisloe because that would have just been absolute anarchy. Um, you know, we 
we did lose to Ireland at home, but we, again, Ireland are the number one team in the world, you know? So there are things to look at, and I, I do think, you know, next year things can change. Look at where the Black Ferns were at the end of last year, and now the World Cup winners. I, I don't think, um, you know, the, the All Blacks, uh, we can count them out because, the, you know, they're still building. <laughs> Ken, for you? Uh, well, four losses are four losses. Um, and you, can, you can't sugarcoat that, mm. um, and you can't make excuses uh, for that, and nor should we, nor should that be the expectation of the All Blacks as well. But if you have a look at a couple of significant things, in my view, the elevation of uh, Ethan De Groot, yes. um, Samasone, Tokiaho, and Tyrell Lomax, when really we were probably at our lowest point mm. with the All Blacks in 2022, um, after you know some would describe as an ordinary 2021 as well, that was a very brave call because it, in large part that's a rookie front row um, that has come in. Um, and with Cody Taylor coming back in, into the mix, they have been, that has been the area where we have made the greatest progress. The All Blacks have made the greatest progress, in, um, in, in my view. Um, Taylor touched on a very good point about, um, about combinations. Um, Harvili's been tried at 12. Quinn Tupai has been tried at 12. Anton Leonard Brown, we all know, can play 12 um, as well. And now Geordie Barrett is, uh, is in the mix. I'm excited about the potential of the Geordie Barrett, Rico Ioane mm. uh, combination. They need time together. They need games together. I don't know what the um, situation is in terms of the build-up for next year, but I, I can't help but think the more games that they play together, the better that's going to be for the All Blacks. Well, you've talked about um, some of those young front rowers being some of the big winners for the All Blacks, but surely you've got to look at a couple of these coaches that have come in as well, the Joe Schmitz and the Jason Ryans. Yeah, exactly, and I think uh, it takes a little while for them to, um, to change the blueprint and really put in what they, what they need to, but if we look on the screen now, there is a, a significant amount of talent and players that are not actually there or being considered at the minute. They're, either, they're either injured or they're just not in favour. And this is what I'm really looking forward to Super Rugby next year and the World Cup year. This is where people have had a gripe all summer, have gone and done their work and they come back and they will... We talk about breakout players. There could be 15, 16 breakout players that are putting their hands up and that's going to bring out the best in everyone else, you know. For me particularly, you look at Perinara being injured now as well as Fakatava. all of a sudden, someone like Roygaard, he's going to get so much time at the uh, Hurricanes and then he could be bolting through yet. Brad Webber at the Chiefs, he's just competing for a position with Xavier Rowe and Cortez Ratama. Any one of them could be there as well. So um, it's, it's really, really exciting um, looking forward rather than just looking back at the moment. After Super Rugby, we were so excited about a couple of players. One, Roger Toivasa Sheik, another one, Leicester Whanganuku. Where are those two now, Taylor, after this end of your tour? Yeah, it's interesting with Leicester, isn't it? Because, you know, he was sent to the All Black 15 and then they kept Mark Talia in with the squad as well. And Roger Tuivasa-Shek, again, kind of guilty of not being able to play too much, at, you know, at the Blues and also with Auckland um, when it comes to NPC. And it's just time in the saddle for people like that. But also you've got to look at it as that All Black 15 environment gave those key players, um, you know, a full game and time in the saddle. So it is still a high-pressure um, environment in the All Black 15 as well. So, look, it, it's going to be interesting because we've just heard the amount of talent that is in that 12 jersey. And I think... That is probably why they've asked Roger to maybe try out the wing as well, because you need um, to be able to play more than one. Well. Yeah, you need to be able to play more than one position in, in that Rugby World Cup squad. Well, in terms of um, the All Black 15, and obviously he's not an All Black, so he wasn't on that list. But um, the best player in the All Black 15 was Sean Stevenson. Yes. Um, so we're going to do about um, we're going to do about Sean. Uh, fabulous. Breakout next year. Well, he'll he'll either be a breakout player next year, or he'll sign and go to Europe. Yeah. Because I would say the value on him. Um, or he might go to the game that you love, Ken. The other game. Oh. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, how many times can you be a breakout player, though? Because yeah. he's had so many outstanding seasons for That's the Chiefs. Right. What's well, Sean? Sean must be 25 now. He's the same age as Rico. Mm. They were in the same first, first 15 to get the Auckland yeah. grammar. But people are getting opportunities out of Super Rugby. We've seen it with Mark Talia. Yeah. We've seen it with Leicester. So they are still... Yeah. giving players opportunities after having good campaigns. Uh, let's go now to back to the UK because Sir John Kerwin and Jeff Wilson have been tourists for the last four weeks from Tokyo to Twickenham. Let's get their tour review. Well, JK, the breakdown's been on tour for a few weeks. We've come to the Northern Hemisphere. There's been some remarkable results. The All Blacks have gone three wins, one draw. You think about what happened in the Northern Hemisphere, Georgia. What have they done? They've just beaten Wales. Italy last weekend beats Australia. Uh, you're still celebrating, I know. But the, if you think about the international landscape, as we go to the end of our season, how does it end up for the All Blacks? 
all said and done after a challenging year? Well, I tell you what, if you had to ask me this midway through the year, would you be happy with the way? Would you be happy with the draw? Would you be happy with them coming over there, dominating for long period of times? I'd go yes, because I think the turnaround's been great. I think we've seen some changes in the All Blacks. They're starting to play some good rugby. They were very good today. Last 10 minutes, OK, yellow card. Let's move on to that. But World Rugby has some huge decisions to make. World Rugby, you are meeting on Monday, Tuesday to speed up our game, to change some of the rules. We want more of a spectacle, and it's on you to go and do that. However, I will tip my hat to you because some of the minor sides are actually starting to get better. Georgia beating uh, Wales in Cardiff. How good is that? I think, um, don't get me wrong, but is it Spain or Portugal? Portugal have just Portugal qualified. Portugal have just qualified. Yep. So the work that you're investing in some of the smaller nations is paying off. But we need a faster, more aerobic game. So there's still some stuff to do. But the rugby at times has been great. And at times it's been really boring. But we can change for next year. And if some of these minor unions come to this World Cup, throw caution to the wind, it's going to be fantastic. Well, you've been told World Rugby. And I think you're right. It, it, it will help us, I'm sure, for the All Blacks. But I, link, I think about the All Black season and what we've done. We've exposed players. We've given them opportunities. The opportunity to take themselves to the next level. And for some of these young men who now tasted playing at Twickenham, tasted playing at Cardiff, it's going to prepare them. But they'll look back, I think, on this game and go, you know what, we need to be better. Yes, it's a simple uh, statement, isn't it? We need to be better. And here is why. Because World Rugby has never been as close it is, as it is right now, right? Well, see, any team on any day can beat another nation. Tier 1, Tier 2, it doesn't matter. No, exactly. And I think a real key thing for World Rugby is when they're talking about World Cup cycles, they really, for them, they really want a Tier 2 nation to make the semi-finals and get to these playoffs because that's, they set goals like any organisation and the development of the game, that's what it means. And, and I think there is. I think Fiji could be a bolter for next year, but... Look at all the results you've got, guys like Chile coming into the World Cup now and, and things like that. And, and Portugal um, get rid of the USA, who, who are hosting it in two years' time. So it's really getting remarkable. That's the one end. But, yeah, at the top end, I think there's six or seven teams that could win this World Cup next year. And it's never been like that before. Yeah, well, if you look at the World Rugby rankings, Ireland, France, New Zealand, South Africa, top four, followed by England, Argentina, Wales, Australia. Is that fair, that top I think list. France should be on top at the moment. I think their favourites heading into the World Cup. Absolutely. Look, they haven't lost a game in the last 12 months and they've beaten every Tier 1 team that there is. You know, they've been in the All Blacks, been in South Africa, Australia. Uh, they're absolutely outstanding at the moment and to think that the World Cup is going to be on their home soil, that's just going to make them even harder to beat. Um, I, I think, you know, they are probably the best in the world right now and DuPont has been outstanding um, as halfback, which is why he's been, you know, nominated again for World Rugby Player of the Year, but also you look at the North American rugby, you know, USA and Canada both not at the Rugby World Cup next year, which crazy. is crazy because we always call them the sleeping giants of rugby because they've got so many athletes, people who don't go on to make the NFL and, you know, the NBA, then they pick up rugby and we see how well they do in the sevens with the likes, you know, Carlin Isles, who was a sprinter and came in and things like that, Perry Baker, but... You know, for them not to qualify for the World Cup is massive and, you know, maybe it's the fact that the MLR needs better administration because there's teams dropping in and out of there. You know, it, it has so much potential, but at the moment they're not um, living up to wh where they could be. France have made... Um, France is scary um, for World Cup in, um, uh, next year. Their under-20s team won the World under-20s in 2018 and 2019. No other country that I'm aware of has done the work at the age grade development level to put programs, processes and um, development players in place to prepare them for the future to the same degree that France has. They've centralised their under 20 uh, program, very, very uh, professional. And not only that, they've searched the world for quality players. Not all of them are born in France. Uh, there was some criticism a few, a few years ago when the Japan, should I say with the French, um, top league, 48 per cent, only 48 per cent of the players playing in the French mm. comp at one stage were eligible for France. They made some major changes to do, and I think only two French players were starting at Bossy, you probably know that. At one stage, only two French players were starting for a top side in the number 10 jersey. Mm. So the work that they've done to change it around, um, to make themselves more competitive and create their own pathways is reflected, as Taylor said, in their unbeaten run in 2022. With that unbeaten streak and having a home World Cup comes enormous pressure as well, doesn't it? Taylor said France are favourites going into it. Do you two think they're favourites? 
I think there's no doubt they're favourites just because the age bracket of their team is just so young and they've been on, on form anyway. But they've also got to do it the hard way. This, we're all on the same side of the draw and that is the hardest side of the draw. We're all meeting each other. There'll be no doubt that probably the team that wins the, um, the All Blacks France in the very first match will go on and not make the final and the other team will and win it, you know what I mean? And we've seen it happen before, but that'll be what, what I think could actually happen and quite likely it, it'll be the monkey off the back for whichever team loses that one. And then you're just, you're fighting your own battle and expectation's gone. It's going to be huge, isn't it? That opening match between the All Blacks and France just 10 months away on the 8th of September in Paris. Time now for your trivia question. New panel today, or new combination of panellists, I should say. You can get involved at home as well. Your question for today, which three All Blacks have drawn their 100th test? Which three All Blacks have drawn their 100th test? 12 All Black Centurions, pick three of them. We'll have the answer for you right after this. No, my hockey, my welcome back into the breakdown. While well, your trivia question was simple this week because you've already got the answer to one, which three All Blacks have drawn their 100th test? 12 Centurions, you've done the math, you've eliminated uh, some of the players. Who have you got, Ken? I've got um, Mialamu, Kieran Reid, and um, Brody. You too? I'm just copying, pasting, phoning oh, a friend over here. That's how I got through high school. It's pure guess, but it's got to be in the modern era, so I've gone Brody, uh, Dan Carter, and Richard McCall. Well, I'll tell you what, Uncle Ken, you were correct. Oh, All wee, three, wee, wee. absolutely beautiful. That's 100%. And you're welcome back on The Breakdown any day. Here is all of our All Black Centurions. You asked me for the list. Here's our 12. Pretty special list, isn't that, when you look at the names on there? Who stand, they all stand out, don't they? Yeah, exactly. It's a fantastic legacy. You know, what do they say? 50, 50 tests is a benchmark, I think, within the culture of the All Blacks mm. themselves. Um, and then to, uh, to get 100, I know they play more tests now mm. um, than they have in the past, so it's, it's easier to achieve that milestone. But nonetheless, uh, when you think about, you know, the, the reflection that we always see about players after their first test to get to 100, and the, the piece that we showed earlier of Brody with, you know, his humility and his grace and the class of guy that he is, mm. and, and understanding and realising how special it is for him to get 100. Very much so. Very, very special. Well, it is time now for the fun part of the show. The fun part of the season, actually. It is awards time because the New Zealand Rugby Awards, the official awards, come out on Thursday the 8th of December. That'll be live right here on Sky Sport at 8.30. But we're going to do our own awards. The first one is the Breakthrough Player of the Year. Now, this can be male, female. Who has been the breakout player of the season? What names are... Oh, I On think, the tip of the tongue. Well, it's probably a, quite an obvious one, but I think there's been a few notables, um, and I know you're probably going to say a couple of the same ones as well. Atelier is a notable one. Uh, Colin Navalli is a notable one. The, the, the women's game, although she didn't play a lot, but I just don't think you can go past Ruby Tui. I just think she's been around so long, I didn't realise she had not actually played 15, so this is it's amazing <laughs> how, how she's... Um, how she's um, how she's done this year. It is, isn't it? I mean, she's been a star on the Seven Series for such a long time, but this year she dedicated herself to the 15s game, made her debut during the Pack Four and was a standout, wasn't she? Oh, it was a big risk for her to take as well because she turned down that Sevens contract and said, I wanted to focus on 15s without actually being guaranteed a 15 spot. And she worked her butt off, really. You know, she she did Opiki, she played in the Farah Palmer Cup, she played for counties and she was always there, you know, having played with her. She's an outstanding athlete, she's a real professional and she brings so much energy to the game. You don't need your own hype woman if you've got Ruby Tui. She is her own hype girl, which is awesome. Um, but I also want to mention Samasoni Tokiaho as well because... Breakout! Yeah, breakout. He, break out? he, he played last year in Well, the that's the play. thing. He was injury cover last year, uh, you know, at the Stone Liga Series. And then now, for me, he is our number one hooker in the country. You know, he, he was called in for Dane Coles at the end of last year and people were scared that you know he's born in Tonga that we're just going to take his eligibility and you know he won't be able to represent Tonga anymore but you know he's going to represent the All Blacks for a very long time in my opinion um, after this season such a good season with the Chiefs which we are both big fans of um, and all of us, anyway. yeah all, except for getting over here um, you know and for him he's solidified his spot in that two jersey well, what about the man that wore the number 14 jersey today? Because we've mentioned him a number of times, right? Mark Talia, has he solidified his spot on the right wing, Ken? He is a true breakout star, isn't he? Well, if you work on the basis that uh, they picked the top 15 to play against 
uh, England. They announced the team on Thursday and they played last night. Of all the right wingers available in New Zealand, uh, Ian Foster chose him. So you'd have to say that for the, for the time being, he, uh, he's there and uh, he's, he's done a terrific job. But I just want to endorse what, um, what Taylor said about Ruby. Um, we can assess catch, pass, run um, and not be able to separate a whole number of classy players. But when I think about um, Ruby, uh, when I think about the role that she's played off the field, when I think about how she's galvanised uh, not only audiences that were inside Eden Park, but audience, global audiences on television. I remember the time, I know I'm going outside of the time period, but she did a couple of those interviews when, um, when she won the gold medal. Mm. Um, you know, her, her personality, um, her fun uh, nature that comes, comes across, and of course her post-match performance. Uh, was something pretty special, you know. Leading, this is you know, this is a Samoan lady, you know, um, leading an audience in a waiata um, live, which has never been done uh, before. You know, Richie McCaw has played over 100 tests and done a lot of interviews. I've never seen him try to lead the crowd <laughs> as a way of thanking and acknowledging. Mm. You know, there's something special about what she has done, yeah. about what the women have done um, in terms of creating that vibe and that excitement for children and families to stay close. And I know I coach. As does Bossy, we, we coach teenage girls teams um, ourselves back in our hometowns and the influence and impact that the Black Ferns has had. And she has been the centre uh, of it. So for, you know, for the footy, we could pick a whole host of players, yeah. but she's certainly in that group that deserves to be acknowledged for every aspect of it on field, but off the field. You know, she's just been a wonderful character um, for our game and to be so confident, so eloquent, so elegant at mm -hmm. such a young age still. Um, she's a very special personality in our game. She's changed the game, hasn't she? The sport, New Zealand will never, ever be the same after Ruby Tui and that Black Ferns uh, entire team and how they have carried themselves in 2022. And if you can't get enough of the sporting action and you feel like a bit of a break, here is the option for you. The Summer of Tennis and the Australian Open is just around the corner. Get closer than ever to incredible Grand Slam action, then linger on for a city adventure with an AO travel package. From soaking up the buzzing atmosphere courtside to exploring the sun, sounds and flavours of marvellous Melbourne. Let the people that know the AO best arrange it all. Well, after the break, we are going to continue our awards night theme and talk about Sorry, the player of the year. But before we do, the New Zealand Rugby Awards are just around the corner, which means it is time for you to vote now on the best try of the year. This is a Sky TV fan try of the year. The first five are coming up for you. You'll get the next five after the break. Thomas, and here comes Richie Tavoy late, running towards the sideline, but he's straightening up now, and just bust through two tackles, they've gone too high on him, he gets the off over away, to his fullback, Fatal Toru, who then links up with Harvey Campbell, this is good old running, and that is a brilliant team try, Tyler Tupper with it, finishing it off. Harvey just need to hold on. Go through phases, which they haven't done. Well, objective number one was to get that set piece going. They've failed badly in that regard, and this is a counter attack now from which New Zealand teams tend to inflict damage to a Palato. Lovely ball inside to McKenzie, and it's taken up by Ruben Love, and he's got Stevenson outside him. Stevenson heading for the corner, and he gets his second try. Ruthless from this New Zealand 15. So George Bauer on the field at 17. Little kick into space. Jordan's after it. He's got it. Will Jordan. Oh, he is quite sensational. Two years he won. Baylor. Oh, finds a hole for Benjamin Wainalu, who's got simple, simple, goes to round one and then two. Four back and field for one minute and open spaces. The Chiefs are Set the back through the minimum. The month to Malia Paul in hands. Orphan have it down on this right hand side. 
But Akolo sticks back in and gets the pass away to Lafayette. And the are in numbers through Blackwell. Demont is here and they've got an open try line. They won't catch her. Demont is going. She's going. And she's gone all the way. Rosie Kelly with her last cast dive. But it was enterprising play from Auckland. And they've got themselves a five-pointer. The Wolbacks have tried to put pressure on at scrum time. The Ireland have always managed to clear the ball. The kick is picked up by Love. And off he goes. Great run down the middle from Raven Love. He split them open. Cullen Grace is there in support. Love's a pass back in for the What a try. Only they feel it's best. What a break from Raven Love. Something out of nothing. And this is Māori All Black Rugby at its best. Inductee, which is Bevan Holmes, number eight. So I just thought I'd make a special mention for that. Well done. Ball one by Rush. Breaking out. As Murray gets over the advantage line. Up goes for Mathalai. He's down the right side. Mathalai. They've got 80 metres. The crowd are on their feet. Quick four metre. Ray Hunter at the close of Pearson. Meters in contact at the moment. The Blues Tonga Fasi and gets a lovely ball away to Eklund. They're playing with so much freedom here. The Blues, Christie. Oh, this is magnificent. Rico Yolani, Tanya. You have just seen the top 10 tries of the year from club rugby in Patoni to Northland to the Rugby World Cup final at Eden Park and everything in between. It is now your time to vote. So head online to, you can see the baseline uh, just on the monitor there, skysport.allblacks.com and it is your chance to vote because you have the final say. I don't know how the judges picked that. You guys were all calling a lot of those tries. How do you differentiate them? Oh, there's some great tries in there, aren't there? And I love the breadth, the width, the breadth of every, you know, league competition around the country. Um, geez, that last one sticks in my mind. I can't get that one out, eh? It's so hard because, like, a lot of them are really good individual efforts or, you know, brilliant team tries. It just depends on, I guess, what, you, what your appetite is. But, man, some fantastic tries. And as you said, Stacey's try, oh, I love that one. Probably one of my favourites. And really nice to see Sam Blackburn from the Patoni mm -hmm. Club. That Patoni Hutt Old Boys Mass, which is a club comp. I don't know that somebody must have done it on their phone and sent it in or um, something. But that's a famous McBain Shield game between Patoni and Hutt Old Boys Marist. Um, it's a tremendous legacy and history behind that contest. Was that a, a drop here to win the match? <laughs> oh, I think so. Oh, that's brilliant. Wow, rugby. It's a sport that just keeps on giving, doesn't it? Time now to continue our breakdown awards uh, by naming your player of the year. All Blacks player of the year, Blackburns player of the year. Ken, who's been the standout in 2022 for you? Ruahe Ru Demont says her mum. Demont says Ruahe. <laughs> um, take your choice. Um, she's my player of the year. Uh, um, with the job that she's done in the number 10 jersey, uh, especially in the, uh, in the big games um, at the World Cup. She's a dominant player also. She's got one of the tries of the year um, there as well. She's been wonderful and a, and a tremendous leader. We're blessed to have somebody like her at the forefront. She's an articulate, considered, intelligent person. Oh, I agree. I'm um, 100% Rua Hay Demont as well. She's the only black fern that has played in every single test this year, which is quite outstanding, and as co-captain as well. Um, a leader on the field and off the field. She's really elusive as a 10 as well, she, and she can play 12, so when there's two playmakers on the field as well, she can really shine. Um, she's been absolutely outstanding. I went to, and as you said, she's really smart, considered. I went to law school with her, and she's very much like that in the class as she was um, on the field, so I can't go past her. But also, um, Adi Savia needs an honourable mention as well. Well because he has been fantastic for the All Blacks.
Yeah, and I do agree. Artie's been class. But, um, look, like we said before, they all backs got a 7 out of 10, and he's been the man at the front for them all season. You can't go past the, the team of the year, which is, I think, the Black Friends. So it has to come from them. Sarah hidden has been good. I know Ruby's been good as well. But I think Portia Woodman's been the standout player for me this, this season, uh, and she's been there pretty much right from the start of the year all the way through. Well, she broke records, didn't she? Becoming the greatest try scorer in Rugby World Cup history. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think, um, you know, I'm, that's my choice for Team of the Year. Black Fern, Wayne Smith is my choice for Coach of the Year. Mm. I just think that the, uh, the women in 2022, they have such an impact uh, on our game. Like those crowds, record crowds, record viewing audiences in New Zealand, record viewing audiences around the world, talking to our colleagues at World, at world Rugby. Yeah. And I definitely think that it's appropriate in 2022 that we acknowledge the progress that the women's game has made. Huge, and I'm sure they're going to have a big night at the New Zealand Rugby Awards as well, the 8th of December. That'll be live on Sky. Uh, not too long left of the show, but before we let you guys go, our final breakdown of the year. We want a bold prediction. Next year is Rugby World Cup year in France. It doesn't get any bigger than this. We'll follow on from the momentum We've just seen at this last Rugby World Cup. What is your bold prediction? Will there be a Nehemi on a scudder moment? Uh, I think there will be a couple. There'll be a few guys um, and started in this team last night that won't make the World Cup. Uh, but my bold prediction... Name them. Oh, jeez, that's putting me on the spot. That's bold. I, I that's the most bold hated man in the country. <laughs> my bold prediction is that Fiji will make it through to the semi-finals and be the first second-tier nation to do so. Nice. So uh, that's, that's what my overall prediction is. And that would be so, so cool, wouldn't yeah. it, Taylor, for you? Well, it would be, for sure. My bold prediction kind of follows on with the Pacific route. Um, I think Tonga might make their first Rugby World Cup quarter-final. You look at the players who have now played for them. George Moala, Malakai Fikito, Augustine Pulu, Vai Fafita, Israel Falau. They are the sleeping giants, I reckon, and I think... There's still a few more players to become eligible too, so I think keep your eye out on the Kalatahi. My bold prediction is that Sean Stevenson will go to the World Cup with the All Blacks next year and that Maya Joseph, outstanding yes. young halfback in the game from Otago, will make her debut for the Black Ferns. Wow, that's a huge prediction. But, I mean, it could happen, right? These are bold predictions that we could see happen oh, over the next year. It is going to be absolutely outstanding. I've just been asked whether I have a bold prediction. That is putting me on the spot as well, just like you. And right now, I've got absolutely no idea since I've been up since <laughs> four in the morning. <laughs> but I just wanted to say it has been a wonderful year of rugby, hasn't it, for our men, for our women, for our club signs, for our first 15. We've been so lucky. We've been so blessed to do it all uh, on Sky Sport. Ken, for you, we'll leave you with the last word. Yeah, well, it's a privilege to do the, to do what we do. Uh, at the end of the day, we get paid to watch rugby. It's not, not a bad gig, the greatest gig um, in the world. I know that we concentrate a lot on um, on the elite side, but our game is made up of 600 clubs, hundreds of secondary schools, volunteers, coaches, managers, and players at the um, at the grassroots level that make our game special and make it all the more enjoyable for us to be involved. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you all for being part. We are nothing without you, the fans and the supporters, and we'll see you next year. It's a new year of international rugby and Ireland come to Eden Park to try and storm a fortress that has for 28 years withstood all challenges. Reasonable performance on a good start. Oh, and over goes Andrew Porter. And Ireland have beaten the All Blacks in New Zealand for the very first time. And no Irish team has ever done it before. It's all down the line next week. Oh, That's is that. Ireland win the series. And they fully deserve to do it. Look, I want to be better, I want the boys to be better, and I want to give them everything I've got. Do the best job I can for my country and, and for the All Blacks. Grab the script and Lawrence there! He's got it! It's been a systematic dismantling. This is where we've been in the past. Backs against the wall, anywhere it goes up. I believe in these guys all the way. I think in many people's minds, had to win here to save Ian Foster's coaching tenure. And the skipper has scored. Zach Payton. And the All Blacks have silenced the critics. For me personally, just my coach, back him 100% side by side. For the board, who have unanimously agreed they have absolute confidence 
that Ian and this coaching group are the right people to lead your blacks through to the World Cup. And here's a chance. Argentina win for the first time in New Zealand. It was just a nice reward for the hard work that we've been putting in to be able to put it out and for everyone to see it. It's been conclusive, absolutely conclusive. Heroic from Japan, by far the tightest margin ever between these two sides. Kisabi throws an outrageous dummy. Season next week at Twickenham. Here I am, pretty proud to be able to say since I achieved 100 games that I have. Here's the pace of Ricky Arnie. I think he's going to go all the way here. What a finish to the season, and what we finish up with at Twickenham is a 25 all draw.